Hello, and welcome to the first and hopefully only virtual alumni collection. Before we begin, I invite you to join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. I'm Bohi Yoon, class of 2001 and president of the Alumni Council. I hope you enjoyed our virtual parade of classes and spotted friends, classmates, or even yourself. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Scott Amphitheater as we recognize and celebrate the collective impact of the alumni community at Swarthmore College. As we planned this virtual collection, our goal was to find a way for Swarthmore alumni to come together and interact with one another. If you are watching this on Facebook, I encourage you to read or comment to share your excitement and thoughts with us. This year's reunion has been unlike any other, a phrase I know we're all tired of hearing, but I want to take the opportunity to reflect on the creative ways alumni have responded to the challenge of turning Alumni Weekend into a virtual year-long celebration. The class of 1961, celebrating their 60th reunion, planned three virtual events despite their class reunion committee spanning a 12 hour time zone difference. One alum is in Hungary, another is in Hawaii, and a whole bunch are in between. The beloved Nathan and the Narwhals pulled off a virtual performance over Memorial Day weekend with attendees dancing and singing along at home. The class of 1976 put together a video performance of over an hour and a half of Swarthmore parodies of songs from their time on campus. Last weekend, the class of 1991 organized a virtual Miles for Nick 5K in memory of their classmate, Nick Jezdanen. Classmates and friends ran, walked, biked, swam, and rode to raise money for the Nick Jezdanen Memorial Summer Opportunity Fellowship. The creativity, the willingness to try something new, and the thoughtfulness demonstrated by this year's reunion classes was truly remarkable. It is now my pleasure to introduce President Valerie Smith, who will share updates from campus, including a look back at the ways students, faculty, and staff responded to COVID-19, and a look ahead to the future of Swarthmore College. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you today. I'm sorry the pandemic prevents us from celebrating in person, but thanks to the creativity and commitment of the folks in alumni relations and advancement, We've been able to celebrate reunion throughout the year with a series of virtual events. To date, we've run nearly 200 virtual events that have included more than 7,800 participants. And we expect to have organized close to 300 events by the end of June. One alumna commented that these virtual events were, quote, intellectually stimulating and relevant to the many aspects of today's world tinted with an appropriate bit of Swarthmore pride. Now you won't be surprised to learn that this has been a challenging and turbulent year on campus, as it has been in so many parts of the country and around the world. Some students, faculty and staff reported feeling overextended, tired and anxious as they juggled a variety of personal challenges in addition to the difficulties of isolation and remote learning and work. But I can also report that I have observed how resilient and adaptable our community is. The faculty work tirelessly to give students a rich and meaningful academic experience. The Dean's Division and the Financial Aid Office work together to make sure that our students' financial needs were met. And the Office of Student Engagement and the Department of Athletics and Physical Education did their best to help students sustain their emotional and physical health and well-being. Staff members made sure that students were well fed and that our campus was safe and sanitized and that we met or exceeded public health regulations. And students did their part by complying with restrictions that kept themselves and other members of our community safe. This has also been a year during which we've witnessed a resurgence of racial violence and demands for racial reckoning. In response, we established the President's Fund for Racial Justice, which has supported course development, guest speakers, and other resources for more than 15 faculty members. The fund also supported an array of public events, 
including virtual conversations with award-winning indigenous author Tommy Orange and former Attorney General Eric Holder. Looking ahead, the college continues to develop new academic programs, such as the Trico Asian American Studies program, and to strengthen existing departments and programs. In addition, the Board of Managers recently committed $134 million to addressing deferred maintenance on campus over the next 10 to 15 years. The Board also recently committed $69 million to an energy plan, the Roadmap to Zero Carbon, that will help us achieve carbon neutrality by 2035. Now, I'm sure you're curious about what life will look like on campus this fall. This year, the college received more than 13,000 applications from prospective students. We're excited to welcome a first-year class of about 470 students this fall, and we're eagerly anticipating a return to a primarily in-person residential learning experience for the coming academic year. I want to conclude by expressing my sincere gratitude to you, our alumni. Last summer, we completed the Changing Lives, Changing the World campaign, raising $440 million from nearly 23,000 donors to connect disciplines, open doors, advance the common good, and reimagine our campus. I want to acknowledge and thank those of you who made donations to the campaign. I'm truly moved by the many ways alumni give back to our community. Thank you for being part of the Swarthmore family. Thank you, President Smith. It is now my pleasure to recognize the 2021 Alumni Award winners. Each spring, Alumni Council presents three service awards. Alumni, classmates, and faculty and staff members submit nominations, which are then reviewed and voted on by Alumni Council, or in the case of the Shane Award, the Advancement Office. It is my pleasure to announce this year's recipients. Up first is the Joseph B. Shane Alumni Service Award. The Shane Award was established in honor of the late Joseph B. Shane, class of 1925, who served Swarthmore College as Vice President for Alumni Affairs and Public Rela Relations for more than 21 years. Joe's service to the college went beyond a simple job description. His warmth, humor, dedication to the college, and Quaker spirit made a lasting mark on Swarthmore and all who knew him. Bob Barr, class of 1956, embodies the very spirit of the Joseph B. Shane Award. Bob first returned to campus only a year after graduation when he came to work in the newly formed admissions office. This job would be the start of a lifetime of service to Swarthmore as an administrator, a volunteer, and a donor. Bob, who majored in political science, later served as Dean of Men and then as Dean of Admissions from 1977 until 1994. An entire generation of Swarthmore alumni owe their admission to Swarthmore to Bob, and many credit their personal connection with Bob as the reason they chose to attend the college. In addition to his storied career at Swarthmore, Bob is a loyal donor to the Chester Children's Chorus, Scott Arboretum, and the Swarthmore Fund. He's a member of the James A. Mishner Legacy Circle and has held numerous volunteer roles, including serving on his 65th Reunion Committee and the McCabe Award Selection Committee. Bob still returns to campus often for the annual Donor Scholar Celebration, as well as Alumni and Garnet Weekends. We are honored to present to Bob Barr with this year's Joseph Shane Award. It is now my pleasure to award the Arabella Carter Community Service Award. Arabella Carter was one of the great unsung heroes who worked for peace and social justice in the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting in the early 1900s. She never sought publicity or recognition for her work and was largely forgotten by all but Friends Historical Library archivists who saw her hand in Quaker peace and social justice work over three decades. She appears to have received no monetary compensation for all these services, living simply on family money. The award honors alumni who have made significant contributions as volunteers in their own communities or on a regional or national level. The council hopes to honor alumni whose volunteer service is relatively unknown. Rochelle, or Shelley Laws, class of 2001, is an in-house attorney and a member of the litigation department at TD Bank. 
Shelley is receiving the Carter Award in recognition of her sustained volunteer work at Action Wellness. Action Wellness started out as Action AIDS in 1986 with the goal to serve people infected with HIV in the greater Philadelphia area. In June 2016, Action AIDS expanded and rebranded so that it could bring the same quality of medical case management, caring family atmosphere, and expertise to more individuals suffering from chronic illnesses. Each year, Action Wellness serves over 4,000 clients through the efforts of over 400 dedicated volunteers like Shelley. Over the past almost 20 years, Shelley has dedicated her time, energy, money, and strategic leadership to Action Wellness. She served for more than 15 years as a buddy, has been on the board of directors for over two years, and is now the president of the board of directors. Please join me in recognizing Shelley Laws for her service. The Eugene Lang Impact Award was named for its first recipient, the late Eugene Lang, class of 1938. The Eugene Lang Impact Award recognizes an alum who has made an impact on society just as Gene Lang did throughout his life. It seems particularly fitting that this year's Eugene Lang Impact Award is presented to our collection speaker, Marcella Nunez Smith, class of 1996. Marcella Nunez Smith is Associate Dean for Health Equity Research, Associate Professor of Medicine, Public Health and Management, and Founding Director of the Equity Research and Innovation Center in the Office for Health Equity Research at Yale School of Medicine. Marcella's research focuses on promoting health and healthcare equity for structurally marginalized populations with an emphasis on centering community engagement, supporting healthcare workforce diversity and development, developing patient reported measurements of healthcare quality, and identifying regional strategies to reduce the global burden of non-communicable diseases. Marcella currently serves as Senior Advisor to the White House COVID-19 Response Team and Chair of the Department of Health and Human Services COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Marcella is board certified in internal medicine, having completed residency training at Harvard University's Brigham and Women's Hospital, and fellowship at the Yale Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Program, where she has also received a master's in health sciences. Originally from the U.S. Virgin Islands, she attended Jefferson Medical College, where she was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society. She earned a BA in biological anthropology and psychology at Swarthmore College. Please join me in congratulating Marcella Nunez-Smith and welcoming her as she delivers this year's collection address. Good day. It's an honor to return to SWAT. Thank you to President Smith for this invitation and congratulations to the Alumni Award winners. Although we aren't gathering in person on our beautiful campus, I deeply cherish this opportunity to gather with members of the Swarthmore community in this way, and to lean into the countless memories we made in this place, and to reinvigorate our shared values and to remind ourselves of our charge as recipients of this phenomenal education. Personally, I am forever grateful for my time at Swarthmore in and out of the classroom. This learning community of other students, faculty, staff, and the broader community members fueled my drive to approach health through the lens of equity, gifting me the foundational knowledge and tools to stay true to our North Star vision anchored in health equity and social justice. As Swarthmore Education offers us these tools and conveys the urgent responsibility to ask deep questions about our world and the way we will live in it. How do particular histories of marginalization and discrimination shape our contemporary life? How do we create resilient and equitable systems? And how do we respect and relate to one another as members of a community, cherishing both our differences and our commonalities? So today I'd like to speak about my work on health equity in the context of these larger questions. Just the end of last month marked the one year anniversary since the killing of Mr. George Floyd. And we continue to grapple, to reckon with the pandemic that has upturned every facet of our lives. 
Also over this past year, we have been heartbroken and outraged at the increase in anti-Asian hate incidents that we have witnessed in businesses, on the street, in schools, and disproportionately directed toward AA and HPI women. While we know that the discrimination faced by the AA and HPI community is not new, the COVID-19 pandemic has heightened inflammatory and xenophobic rhetoric with tragic consequence. This overdue conversation on racial justice is inseparable and should be from our collective understanding of the effects of COVID-19. We should not try to understand the tragedy and the toll of the pandemic without looking towards this drastically unequal burden on communities of color and other marginalized groups. Pacific Islander, Latino, indigenous, black and brown Americans all have a COVID-19 death rate double or higher that of others. Immigrants, those who are just as involved, people experiencing houselessness. These communities are often too unseen in the data, but we know they have been disproportionately affected. Marginalized communities have been unequally burdened by the economic consequences of the pandemic. Undocumented immigrants who are systematically excluded from social safety net services, tribal health systems challenged in getting needed resources, people with disabilities, essential workers who have never been in a position to take time off from work or to protect themselves fully through social distancing. In this moment, as we in the United States are wading into the hopeful territory of widespread vaccine availability and uptake, seeing the reopening of schools and businesses, seizing opportunities to finally reconnect in person with loved ones, we cannot, should not forget about inequity on the global scale. Although the virus does not recognize borders, Actions to alleviate the virus do. The benefits of medical innovation and discovery remain unevenly distributed. Closer to home, recognition of the role of discrimination in health is growing. Last month, the CDC declared racism a serious threat to the public's health, calling for confrontation of the systems and policies that have resulted in the generational injustice that has given rise to racial and ethnic health inequities. The CDC is committing to recognizing and operationalizing research that demonstrates the profound and negative impacts of racism on the health of communities of color. Across the country, local and state leaders are declaring racism a public health crisis or emergency. At least 208 to date, local and state government entities have made a declaration, including 95 city and town councils, 45 county boards, 45 health entities, 14 governors and mayors, and three state legislatures. These efforts on the part of the CDC and local and state governments acknowledge that while the events of the past year have made us crucially aware of COVID skew toll in communities of color, there has never been, there has never been a year in which these communities have not suffered disproportionate burden of death, illness. Health and illness and well being, they're not distributed evenly across groups. Those who live at the margins are always and predictably disproportionately burdened by often treatable conditions. In the US Virgin Islands, one of our country's territories where I grew up, people too often die too young from preventable illness. My father had his first stroke in his 40s. It was caused by high blood pressure, a chronic condition that could have been treated but was diagnosed too late and never well controlled. From these early years, I began to understand there are deeper dimensions to health beyond human biology and genetics. When I eventually moved into my own medical training, I saw countless patients whose conditions were shaped by factors having nothing to do with biology and everything to do 
with broader social inequity. Through my childhood, through my training, I saw people I loved, people in my care who were marginalized by place and by race, resulting in devastating health disparities, unnecessary loss of life and diminished human potential. Longstanding exposure to environmental toxins, inability to access high quality and trustworthy healthcare, housing and nutrition insecurity, limited educational economic opportunity, these are the drivers of health outcomes. And in this country, they are structurally intertwined with institutionalized racism. Social economic factors drive over 60% of the variance we see in health outcomes, much greater influence than biological genetic factors. But for far too long, medical research, medical care have been siloed off from the contextual realities of people's lives. We have been reminded of this at every turn in the pandemic. It is not enough to enforce business and school closures to protect our loved ones. We must in parallel ensure continued economic and educational resource access, especially for marginalized and minoritized communities. It is not enough to authorize safe and effective treatments and vaccines. We have to ensure diverse and inclusive representation in clinical trials and in the scientists and the policymakers who are involved. And we also, also have to make these technologies accessible in a way that makes sense for people, always meeting them where they are, removing structural barriers at every step of the way. So with the understanding that this past year has been both incredibly challenging and illuminating, highlighting some fundamental structural problems. I'd like to talk now about some of the steps we can take to address these patterns of inequity in healthcare. First off, we have to engage with communities at every step of the way. Communities are expert in what they need. At Yale School of Medicine's Equity Research and Innovation Center, we partner with community organizations and leaders to facilitate inclusion and power sharing in research. Foregrounding community needs, elevating community voice, community governance from the beginning. I'm deeply honored to have a seat at the table in the Biden-Harris administration's response to COVID-19, advising on strategies that acknowledge the centrality of community. Centering equity in the access to PPE, to testing, to therapies and vaccination, and thinking ahead pathways to economic and educational opportunity and making sure everyone has access to high quality, trustworthy healthcare. To talk for a second about vaccination, the federal vaccination channels program all allocates vaccines directly to partners using a place-based approach to target resources to the hardest hit and highest risk communities centered in equity and designed to supplement the hyper-local work necessary by states, tribes, territories, and local jurisdictions. Sending vaccines directly to community health centers across the country, being intentional about where community vaccination centers are sited, partnering with over 40,000 retail pharmacies and deploying mobile vaccination sites. All of these initiatives launched in the first three weeks of the administration and these channels are all reaching the intended recipients. And making sure the structural barriers that I referenced are addressed, be it transportation, access to paid time off, walk up, no appointment necessary, slotch childcare, making sure vaccination is easy and convenient, that everyone knows vaccination is free and there'll be no out-of-pocket cost, The government issued ID is not required, documentation status does not matter, and data privacy is maintained. But how did we get here? You know, we need to acknowledge structural racism, its presence in our medical institutions. These conversations as we talk about those people who are still deliberating vaccine and building vaccine confidence, it goes hand in hand with this long overdue discussion of the historical incidents of racism in American medicine, Tuskegee, Henrietta Lacks, James Marion Sims, gynecological, gynecological experiments. But we have to always keep in mind that for many, many people, institutionalized racism is a contemporary everyday reality when they seek medical care. We need to elevate patient voice and capture specific aspects of the patient experience related to equity. That is an issue 
of quality as well. We have to ensure diversity representation and anti-racism in our health professional schools, in our health professional organizations. In terms of research priorities, a long history of racialized and targeted policies and practices in this country in housing, nutrition, education, healthcare, policing, immigration, employment, they function to marginalize too many, systematically limiting access to opportunity. We have to look much more closely at how sweeping social and structural drivers shape health. We must no longer find professional satisfaction in describing patterns of inequity and injustice. The commitment must be there to intervene and drive change. For communities that experience stressful living conditions as a normative reality of life, we need to do more mechanistic work. Dysregulation of physiological systems, epigenetic modifications, immune inflammation, inflammatory response have been proposed as resource foci that emphasize the physiological effects of chronic social stressors. These concepts help to emphasize how drastically the context, the conditions of life influence our biological health outcomes. We need to advance our understanding that it is Racism, not the abstract social construct of race itself that drive inequity. We need better data. Our current data and data systems simply do not, do not accommodate the sociodemographic complexity experienced across communities. On the data front, we must insist on the complete disaggregated and intersectional data that are necessary for a data-driven approach to enable health systems, organizations, and communities themselves to advance health equity. When we look to the pandemic itself, demographic data collection has improved since the beginning, yet the data do remain incomplete and missingness is not random, not only for communities of color, but for all medically underserved groups. Rural communities, undocumented immigrants, people experiencing houselessness, those who are incarcerated, gender and sexual diverse people, disabled individuals, we still do not know the full extent to which these communities are suffering. And of course, working towards health equity is not a task only for health professionals and researchers. We need to create partnerships across sectors, across domains. From medicine to politics, to environmental justice, economic reform, we need to develop policies and practices that integrate health and well being into the fabric of everyday life, a recognition that health should be prioritized in all policies. When we think about health through this panoramic view, we can develop the language and the tools that we need to create lasting change. And with this, I want to return to the questions I opened with and ask. How can we use this moment to interrogate and improve the systems that tie us together? How can we create a healthcare system that is incentivized to create and sustain health and well being for everyone? How can we restore trust in our political systems and in the process recognize each other's humanity? As we've seen over the course of this pandemic, we do not have a countrywide consensus as to what information and authority we trust. And in many cases, medical and political institutions have actively earned distrust. The reality remains, we will not successfully overcome this pandemic unless we overcome it together. Recognizing the vital reciprocity between social, economic, political realities and health outcomes. My hope is that this pandemic will be an inflection point for the way we live together moving forward. History will judge us. We are called upon to disrupt the predictability of who is always the most severely affected, who is first to be forgotten in times of national crisis and when resources are limited. We can and must meet this moment. This is our collective imperative. Let me again express my gratitude to Swarthmore for inviting me to share these thoughts. I'm honored to be back amongst alum and friends of the college and always energized by the presence and depth of perspective within this cherished community. Let me thank you for everything you are doing to get us all to the other side of this pandemic and ultimately to a new and better normal.
please be well. Thank you, Marcella. You have given us all so much to think about. Before we end today's collection, we'd like to offer a moment to pause and reflect. At the beginning of the academic year, Dean of First Year Students Karen Henry, class of 1987, encouraged the first year students to consider a set of queries throughout orientation and over the course of their time at Swarthmore. In that spirit, we felt that it would be fitting to share a few of those queries, which were selected to reflect the particular challenges of the past year with all of you today. The queries are, given this time of uncertainty, what have I learned about myself? What have I lost and what have I gained? How do I contribute to the common good? As Dean Henry shared with the first year students, Quakers believe that returning repeatedly to the same prompt for deep reflection can set the stage for new understanding, changes of heart, and a greater sense of work that needs to be done. I encourage you to share your thoughts in the comments now as we pause for a few moments of reflection or discuss with friends and classmates the next time you see them. Thank you all for joining us today. I look forward to celebrating together again soon. As is tradition, we will close out today's presentation with the singing of the alma mater. I encourage you to sing along or simply sit back and enjoy this performance by past and present members of the Swarthmore College Garnet Singers and the Swarthmore College Chorus. Strange and stands before us on the campus fair. Thy high spirit guarding o'er us through thy blessing share. Thee we praise with songs of gladness, name thy glories all. Hail to thee our alma Hail, all hail, Swarthmore. Every stone of alma mater holds a memory dear. Every ripple of crumbs water is a greeting clear. Here we praise with songs of gladness, name. Say no.